Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started here. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Let me greet you in the traditional language of my relatives. How mataki api, shante washte, napachiuzapi, Patrice Kunish imachiapi. Hello, my relatives. I greet you with a warm handshake and heart. My name is Patrice Kunish, and I am the Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans at the Administration for Children and Families. I also am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Native American Affairs. And I am so pleased to be here with all of you today. I'd like to give my sincere thanks and gratitude to the ACF Office of Ch Early Childhood Development and Deputy Assistant Secretary Katie Hamm for partnering with ANA on this four-part webinar series on Native Early Childhood Development. Native Early Childhood Development is really near and dear to my heart. It's one of the most important investments we can make in our Native children and families to help them thrive and become resilient and be strong adults. Research shows that quality early childhood education leads to long-term social and economic benefits. Children who take part in an early childhood education program are more likely to be successful as teenagers and adults. They also are 25% more likely to graduate from high school and four times more likely to complete a bachelor's degree. In addition, they're also less likely to face academic problems, including repeating grades or dropping out. And once these children do graduate, they tend to earn more in the workforce. And because children's brain develop faster from birth to the age of five, more than any other time in their lives, in fact, 90% of brain development occurs before a child enters kindergarten, we need to focus on providing high quality programs as well. And what's really, really striking to me and the work that we do in the Administration for Native Americans is we know that children who learn their native languages during this period of development show strong attributes of resiliency and problem solving later on. Language is critically important at this age because when children use their language to form strong connections to their culture, they also develop durable senses of identity and connections to community, which are so vital for carrying on the Native culture into the future. And this is why we at ANA value the importance of early childhood development in promoting the optimal growth, development, and well being of Native children and families. Through our grant funding and engagements like today, ANA seeks to enhance nurturing early childhood experiences and healthy development through a child's critical early years. This four part monthly series will feature ANA and ECD grant recipients, as well as subject matter experts who are advancing early childhood development in Native communities. They will share their innovative approaches and best practices that enhance outcomes for Native children and families. So today in this session, we will explore how integrating Native culture, traditions, practices, and languages into ECD programs can create learning environments that empower Native students to navigate a globalized cultural landscape with confidence and self-respect. We will also explore strategies for educators to effectively bridge the Native and non-Native worlds and create inclusive educational experiences that honor the past while creating inclusive and culturally responsive educational experiences. Pila Mayaye, thank you very much. I really appreciate that you are with us today. And now I'm going to pass it over to Deputy Assistant Secretary Katie Hamm. Thank you so much, 
Commissioner Kanush and the Administration on Native Americans for your partnership in this deeply meaningful work. It's really an honor to be among such a dedicated group of early childhood educators, tribal leaders, advocates, and community leaders, all committed to the well being of children and families in Native communities. Um, as Commissioner Kanush said, my name is Katie Ham. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development at the Administration for Children and Families. At the Office of Early Childhood Development, we work closely with hundreds of tribes and tribal organizations from across the country and partner on three programs that we administer, the Child Care and Development Fund, Head Start, and Tribal Home Visiting. In recognition of tribal sovereignty and self-determination, supporting Native language and culture is really at the heart of our work. We know that supporting Native language and culture in early childhood is central to our partnership with tribal nations and has a multitude of benefits for children, families, and Native communities. We also acknowledge that the actions of the U.S. government over several centuries have significantly disrupted the intergenerational transmission of Native culture, language, and traditions. Mm -hmm. And as part of our nation-to-nation -nation relationship, we seek to remove any barriers that tribes may encounter in using their early childhood funds to support centering their programs on Native culture, traditions, and language. Our work is guided by a deep respect for the cultural heritage and resilience of tribes. And we recognize that any effective early childhood program must be centered in culture and inclusive of the traditional practices that have supported tribal communities for generations. These elements are foundational in the early years of a child's life as they shape a child's identity, self-esteem, and sense of place in the world. One approach that the Biden-Harris administration has taken to ensure that tribes can serve their own communities in child care and Head Start is to prioritize enrolling children from the tribal community and making sure tribes are the ones deciding who to enroll in those programs. So in March of this year, President Biden signed into the law a policy that allows American Indian and Alaska Native Head Start programs to prioritize serving children in their community regardless of income. We also right now have a proposed regulation for the Child Care and Development Fund that if enacted would allow tribes to serve any Indian child regardless of income. In the chat, we will provide a link to the Federal Register where you can find more information on that proposed regulation, um, as well as additional resources from the Office of Child Care. We are accepting comments on this notice of proposed rulemaking until September 16th, 2024, so you have just over a month. Be sure to submit your comments and let us know your reaction so that we can incorporate that into final rulemaking. Today, we will have the privilege of witnessing and learning from the many successes and strengths of early childhood programs that center language and culture in Native communities. I want to thank you for your commitment to and your passion for supporting this work, and I look forward to meaningful discussion today. With that, I will turn it over to Sarah Bloom and Stacey Schaff, um, who will be talking about Head Start. Thank, Thank you so much, Katie. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, this is Sarah Bloom. I am um, a policy analyst at the Office of Head Start and tribal policy is a big part of my portfolio and it is just such a privilege and honor to be with you all today. And I wanna pass it over to my colleague, Stacy to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, I second Sarah's um, gratitude for being here today. I'm a tribal policy analyst with the Office of Head Start and um, really looking forward to today's discussion. Thanks, Stacey. I think we can go to the next slide. So when we think about language and culture in American Indian and Alaska Native Head Start programs, it is challenging to tease out because language, culture, traditional practices are embedded in every aspect of Tribal Head Start programs. And truly, Tribal Head Start programs continue to pave the way and have been some of our best teachers in how this work gets done. 
Um, to give an overview of what Region 11, our tribal um, programs and Head Start look like, um, Region 11 and Head Start is funded by the Office to federally recognized tribes or consortia of tribes. In fiscal year 23, we served um, 151 grant recipients. Um, it totaled to just over 351 million. We served um, just shy of 22,000 kids, 72% of which um, were preschool age children, so ages three to five in our Head Start program. And 26% um, were infants, toddlers, and pregnant women. Um, AIN funded enrollment accounts for 2.6% of the total funded enrollment in the Head Start and Early Head Start program at large. Um, in thinking about funding and how folks can utilize Head Start funds toward language and culture efforts and programs, um, there's a lot of different funding mechanisms that programs can use, and I will breeze through the couple on the screen knowing that there are actually even a few more at folks' discretion. Um, AIN Head Start programs can use their base grant funds to support their efforts in this area. This might include paying wages for a person in the classroom who's a fluent speaker or a language teacher. Um, we have training and technical assistance funds that also go towards um, trainings that support programs, language goals. And then lastly on the screen, we make mention of our one-time program, program improvement funding pot. And these funds are also used by programs to support needs um, in this space as well. On the slide, you'll see um, we have linked to an information memorandum that came out a few years ago on native language preservation, revitalization, restoration, and maintenance in our program. I think Stacy just placed it in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, and encourage folks to check that out. It is some guidance that clarifies um, that Office of Head Start fully supports um, teaching tribal languages to children in AIN Head Start and Early Head Start, and also has strong support and guidance on full integration of, of AIN languages and culture in our programs. Um, Head Start continues to strive to find ways to provide guidance and support so that tribes can fully integrate language and culture in their programs. And with that, I think we can go to Stacy and the next slide. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, um, you know, we have heard so many amazing examples of programs that are doing an exemplary job of embedding language and culture in their programs. And we're seeing programs with um, who are implementing language and cultural immersion by using traditional calendars, um, different types of land-based learning, music, art, and dance and fully immersive language programs. And we're also seeing facilities being built that are culturally reflective of tribal nations, um, which is just beautiful and amazing. Um, programs are doing really interesting and important work engaging families in traditional practices. We have heard examples of programs gathering families for traditional harvesting activities and engaging in a variety of cultural events throughout the year. Um, in addition, many of uh, Tribal Head Start programs partner with tribal colleges and universities um, to help their teachers obtain degrees and credentials, with, which also support um, the passing of cultural and linguistic knowledge into early childhood education programs. Um, so we just wanna thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share with you today. Um, again, our office continues to be amazed by the ways in which programs are centering language and culture in their classrooms and beyond. And now I think I'm handing it over to Sarah Stafford with the Office of Child Care. Thank you. Sarah Stafford, So everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Stafford and I'm a senior tribal specialist within the Office of Child Care, uh, where we support the implementation of the Child Care and Development Fund or CPDF. Uh, the Office of Child Care supports tribal sovereignty and self-determination for tribal nations in designing child care and early learning programs that meet the needs of all Indigenous children served within their programs. 
Nearly 95% of all federally recognized tribes receive CCDF grant funds, and we disseminated nearly $600 million to Indian country this year for child care services. We have 10 regional offices across the country that support and provide one-on-one -on -one help and assistance to tribal nations in designing and delivering child care and early learning programs that meet their needs. CCDF tribal lead agencies can use a significant portion of their funds on indigenous language and cultural initiatives, projects, and activities for all children in child care within their service areas. In fact, tribes who have a small allocation designation, which is over half of the CCDF tribal nation recipients, could choose to use all of their CCDF funds on quality improvement efforts, which is the type of expenditure, expenditure for the mm -hmm. most part, where language <laughs> and cultural revitalization efforts reside. OCC has training and technical assistance providers that have existing mm -hmm. resources and training support. Yeah. Do we have to have the video on? Um, Sorry, I hear some feedback. Do folks want to take a look and make sure that they're muted if they don't intend to speak? Great. So OCC has training and technical assistance partners that have existing resources and training and support available to all tribal CCDF lead agencies upon request. And tribes really have broad flexibility in defining their quality improvement goals and activities for their CCDF program which is where we see a lot of indigenous resurgent activities um, uh, come through within CCDF programs. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So again, tribal lead agencies can identify individual activities or larger project-based initiatives to improve the quality of childcare provided. And some of the activities listed here are just samples of the ways that tribes have been using their quality funds to support indigenous language and cultural revitalization efforts within their nations and communities. So OCC supports and encourages um, tribes using their funds to pay for the development of a language or curriculum, culture curriculum. You can pay for language teachers, including elders and community members within your community. CCDF doesn't have a minimum set of um, criteria for credentials for teachers. Tribal nations set that for their CCDF program. Um, you can also use CCDF funds to pay for language instruction and provide training to your staff or child care providers, purchase any supplies needed for language and cultural activities, pay elders specifically to support the development of your resources, and pay language speaking providers and staff higher wages or payment rates as a way to honor their special expertise that they're providing to your children. Tribes are also able to use CCDF funds on construction or major renovation of childcare facilities, and many nations choose to incorporate culturally significant designs in their construction projects. Please, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to us to connect, and we would be happy to provide any kind of support as you explore how to use CCDF funds to support, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the critical cultural and langu language revitalization efforts within your nation and community. Um, you'll see two QR codes on your screen. One is to get connected to the Office of Child Care, and then the other is to connect to all of the amazing training and technical assistance opportunities that we have available to. Now I for your time, and I will hand this over to Moshini. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. It's so great to be with you. I'm Moshni Beltangedi. I'm the Director of the Tribal Early Childhood Division in the Office of Early Childhood Development and the Program Manager for the Tribal Home Visiting Program, um, which is part of the larger Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, or MCV. Our program is funded by a 6% set aside from the MCV program and provides grants to tribes, consortia of tribes, tribal organizations and urban Indian organizations to develop and implement evidence-based home visiting programs for expectant families and families with young children from birth to kindergarten entry. In home visiting programs, a trained home visitor uh, goes into the home of a family or another location that the family prefers and provides education and support to families and connects them to needed resources. 
Um, it's a program that really provides a lot of important support to young families and their children. Um, and we really want to emphasize um, that language and culture is really a critical part of the way that our uh, grant recipients serve their families and children in their communities. We currently have 47 grant recipients in 27 states. And right now we're funded at $33 million a year and our funding continues to go up. So be on the lookout for additional notices of funding opportunity in the coming years um, to join the program. Next slide. So integration of native language and culture, as I said, is a huge priority for Tribal McBee uh, grant recipients. Um, our program is what's called an evidence-based program. So recipients are implementing evidence-based models um, in order to provide home visiting services. Um, but the challenge is that most of these models have never been uh, developed in tribal communities or studied in tribal communities. So there's a real challenge in terms of implementing these models in communities where they weren't developed and tested. Therefore, it's really flex in, uh, critical that our grant recipients have the flexibility to incorporate tribal languages, cultures, and traditions into the, the delivery of evidence-based home visiting models. We've talked with our grantees and they've surfaced at least three approaches they're taking to doing this. One is intentional enrichment, where they seek natural ways to integrate home visiting model into the culture of the community, such as hiring native staff and consulting with tribal cultural leaders and elders. Second, progressive enhancements, where grantees progressively add enhancements to the model, such as using the native language, incorporate crafts and storytelling, and connecting families to traditional cultural events. Finally, some grantees make significant changes or structural adaptations to the home visiting model and consult with the model developer on the changes. We've even had grantees who have developed their own models or supplements based on cultural knowledge and traditions. For example, creating a three to five year old cultural curriculum with a selected model um, worked only with children under three years old. So there's many ways that programs can um, support language and culture, including supporting a percentage of time of language and culture staff on the grant or an elder as an advisor, integrating elders and cultural practitioners into staffing or as a consultant, focusing on language and culture in group activities, such as having traditional crafts or harvesting traditional foods, um, providing professional development to staff on language and culture, paying for technology to support language preservation work as part of home visiting programs, and paying for cultural supplies. So there's really a lot of ways that programs uh, can do this type of integration. Um, you can see on the screen a photo of one of our recent issue briefs, um, which talks about the different ways that grantees are implementing cultural enhancements, adaptations, and, and supplements into home visiting programs. And the QR code on the screen links directly to that report. So definitely encourage you to take a look at that and see some examples of ways that our grantees have, have integrated language and culture. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Commissioner Kunish to introduce our panel and, or actually to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Sim. So Commissioner Kunish, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Moshimi and Katie and Sarah and the whole team at uh, ECD for advancing Native Early Childhood Development programs and services. Next, I am really excited to introduce and welcome Dr. Christine Sims to share her expertise on early childhood development. Dr. Sims of Acoma Pueblo in New, in New Mexico is an associate professor in the Department of Language Literacy and Sociocultural Studies in the College of Education at the University of New Mexico. She completed her doctoral work at the University of California at Berkeley focusing on the issues of heritage language maintenance and revitalization among Native American tribes. It just sounds really phenomenal. She specializes in indigenous language revitalization and maintenance issues, providing technical assistance to tribes in Native language program planning, training language teachers through UNM's College of Education's American Indian Language Policy Research and Teacher Training Session. So welcome, Dr. Sims. We're so happy you can be with us today. Thank you, Commissioner, for your introduction. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, and welcome, everybody. I will 
greet you in my traditional language, which is Akamakeras. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to join you in this important discussion. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the things I'm hearing even prior to my coming on as uh, one of your speakers today. Uh, and I, I say that because, um, you know, it has not been that long uh, since we have really had these deeper discussions about the importance of native language development in early childhood. Even 10, 15 years ago, this really wasn't to me in the work that I do with language programs here in New Mexico and other parts of the US, you know, this aspect of native language development is, is something that um, has taken on more increased importance. And I'm, I'm heartened to see that agencies like ANA and, and all the folks that have spoken here um, are mindful of the critical nature of why native language development is so important in the early years of, of children's development. So I'm going to um, just give some brief commentary, overall kinds of commentary with regard to this, this subject of native language development. Um, certainly this is an issue that is dear to the hearts of all native indigenous nations across our country. We know that the legacy, uh, the historical legacy of how education institutions in federal policies, both state and federal, uh, have impacted native languages over decades is a story that we are now having to grapple with because the legacy of several generations of language shifting away from native language use more towards English. And uh, we also know that in the early years, this was uh, of our ancestors and, and relatives who went through early boarding schools, that impact of losing language already started back then, but it has continued on down through generations to where we are now today. Uh, and we know that the legacy of um, what is sometimes called linguistic trauma has visited almost every community in our nation such that there are now young school age generations, parent generations, even middle adult generations uh, who are not strong in that native language anymore or who have not learned it uh, as a young child. So <clears throat> the messaging of these public policies and practices for a long time have also left a lasting impact on the minds of how we think early childhood education should be. And a lot of that, unfortunately, in the past, and, and it still continues to a large degree now, and we hope to turn that narrative around. But a lot of that messaging is still about the hegemony of English. And while we don't negate the importance of uh, children learning English, because they will need that, especially the academic English of schooling, it shouldn't be at the price of losing a native language. And, and unfortunately, like I said, historically, that has been the messaging that has come through a lot of federal policies and programs. So I'm very, very uh, glad to hear that narrative, that discourse changing. And we now need to make sure that our local communities, our local leaders, our parents, our understanding of that messaging that now encourages the development of native languages, especially with children under the age of five. I can't tell you how much this means in terms of communities because this issue of language maintenance and in some cases language revitalization are really existential issues for native people. Um, it, it, it has to do with the continued maintenance of culture and language and culture go hand in hand. And to whatever degree a community continues to maintain its language also reflects a lot upon the maintenance and stability of indigenous culture. And that's inclusive of many things, many things. It's inclusive of cultural knowledge. It's inclusive of community well-being because this, every individual uh, uh, learns his 
place in, in the larger linguistic and cultural community and is able to participate in that and contribute in some way, that also contributes to the overall well-being of a community. And in language learning, native language learning, that is an integral part of how children learn to become part of a cultural community. When they hear, when they see how language is used by other speakers in their immediate family, their extended families, their relations in, in a given community, that's how children begin to form those essential critical foundations of personal self-identity, cultural identity, and community identity. So those building blocks, if you will, are, are formed very early on in a child's you know, development. And so we can't negate then the importance of language and culture as being part of that foundational develop, development for Native children. And like I said earlier, different communities are at different points based on their histories of being impacted, the degree of impact they have encountered with regard to language loss, language shift. But whatever point at which they find themselves today, it is critical that agencies like the ones that have just been mentioned are supportive of that, that they are open to listening to community priorities about why language is important to teach about why cultural aspects are an important element of being reflected in curriculums, in program activities, and how those building blocks of cultural beliefs, cultural values, those are the cornerstones, if you will, of early childhood education for Native children. Those are things that historically have been ignored or marginalized. And now it's kind of turning 180 degrees to see that those then should be the foundations for Native children's learning. There are so many aspects concerning the benefits of learning another language. And certainly that applies to learning your own heritage Native language, but we haven't given our own children enough opportunities to do that especially before the age of five, before they even enter formal schooling. So as one of the ladies mentioned earlier, the benefits, uh, I think commissioner, you were the one that mentioned the benefits that come academically, the benefits that come from, uh, uh, that benefit from a child developing identity, uh, the benefits that come from social well-being. Um, all of those are elements that are tied to the development of the native language. Because let's face it, most all of our children have already been exposed to English. And in many cases, English is their dominant language. So learning a native language becomes an additional cognitive, you could say, pathway that they begin to develop in the brain. Our indigenous languages are complex. There are complex languages, but they are very unlike English. In fact, they have no relation to English. So when a child begins to develop the, the neurons and those things start clicking in the brain uh, about learning to understand and learning to use a different communicative system, like an indigenous language, I, I, I can just imagine the synapses going on in a child's brain when those connections start to be made. Those cognitive benefits then come with not only English that they already know, but also now the native language. And so that's really what we're after in terms of what can we, what can children gain from having the opportunity to hear that language being used in their everyday surroundings? What can children benefit from observing how people use that language in different social contexts? And what is it that they develop in terms of cultural literacy that will benefit them in the long run? What will give them the confidence of being a learner as they begin to learn who they are? how they fit into their own cultural society, what they can contribute as future leaders, in fact, of our own communities. These are the long-term impacts. These are the long-term goals and hopes, I believe, and priorities of many of our communities. 
And so whatever we can do in terms of early childhood programs, supporting them in the way that they carry out culture and language instruction, those are the things that we need to really, really pay attention to and support and advocate for. And I would add here, parents also need that encouragement because sometimes they are the number one folks who are ambivalent about seeing uh, more of an emphasis on native language because there is still that myth around that says, oh, if we spend too much time with a child emphasizing the importance of them learning language, it takes away from English. Nothing could be farther from the truth, okay? Because in fact, a child can learn two, three, four languages simultaneously at the same time. We see that around the world in all different countries and cultures, but for something, for some reason here in the US, it's been an anomaly, something that's not uh, doable, something that's not helpful. All of that, we should throw out the window and say, no, there are benefits. There are things that can come in terms of benefiting children when they are given the opportunity to hear that language and learn it. So in essence, that's my messaging in terms of an overview, because I know there are more specific information that our panelists today are going to share in terms of how they've carried out some of these uh, initiatives in, in their local programs, in their local communities. And that's what I think we can learn from because they've in essence paved the way, they've opened the doors to seeing how these kinds of new initiatives uh, can take place within our own Head Start programs, within our own communities. So I am very encouraged to hear their stories as well today. So I will stop there because I know we've got a timeline to, to adhere to, but there'll be a time when I will be able to chat with you in the breakout sessions. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner, for giving me time um, to share my, my thoughts here. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sims, for your very insightful presentation and for opening the doors for all of us to be part of this space as well. Now we get to welcome our esteemed panel of early childhood professionals. We are joined by Dr. Natina hicks Greendeer of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe in Massachusetts, a tribe that has spent a lot of time and effort and energies into their language revitalization program. Vanessa Thunder of the Lower Sioux Indian Community here in Minnesota, and Marianne Fanger from the Claire Swan Early Learning Center in Alaska. And I've gotten to, I've been able to visit all of these programs over the years, and most recently uh, the Claire Swan uh, Center in, in Alaska. So welcome everyone. Uh, please take a moment to introduce yourselves uh, very briefly and share how you incorporate language and culture into your early childhood development programs. And if we could, let's start with Dr. Green, dear, followed by Vanessa Good Thunder, and then Marianne Fanger. Um, Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. My name is Natana hicks Greendeer, and um, I am the head of school for Awidamu School, uh, which is um, pre-K through third grade, uh, Wampanoag Language and Culture School. Um, in our early days, we've been in, we're headed into our ninth school year um, this end of this month. Um, and we early on began um, with the intention of doing full immersion, um, but we haven't been able to sustain uh, a teaching staff that can support that. And I think COVID really kind of impacted that a lot. Um, we lost a few teachers, but what we've been really focused on uh, in our classrooms since then has been um, making sure that our students are um, using language and and um and are focused on what parts of our classroom are really explicitly cultural every day um so we're we're located in our tribal building um our like our government center which is a really great benefit i think because it allows all of our students to 
you know, to see their, their family and their, you know, the operations of our tribe every day. And so in some ways, you know, we've got our natural resources department workers going in and out and they get to ask questions about that and see what that's like. And, you know, they have, you know, people coming in and out of their classroom on a pretty regular basis. Um, so there's specific parts of the day that we are devoting to language um, and that we are devoting to culture, as well as having it integrated into different parts. But I think um, just a part that I'd like to highlight, I think, um, is that uh, in the building two days a week, we also have an elders language class. And that has been a really cool way for us to bring both culture and language um, into both of those those classroom spaces, right? Both for the elders and for the, the children, um, you know, you know, making it intergenerational, but also our, without going into too much detail, because I know I don't have a ton of time, um, we are, we don't have any adult native speakers of Wampanoag language. And so it's actually our adult speakers or our adult learners who are learning language from our children. Um, while our children are able to get, you know, different cultural teachings from our our elders when they come into the classroom. So it's been a really unique, um, but I think really beneficial, um, you know, just kind of general learning environment that our, our children are, are in, which is really cool. So. Thank you, Dr. Green, dear. Uh, over to you, Vanessa. Well, homie, Dr. Yapi, a hippie came on staff, but that's a good thing to remark, Yapi. Hello, everybody. My name is Vanessa Goodthunder. My Dakota name is Nasnawi, and I come from the Lower Sioux Indian community, which is in southwest Minnesota, and we are a birth to five Dakota language school. So we're early Head Start and Head Start. Um, we opened doors in August of 2018. And the reason why we opened is because we only have five first language speakers left in the state of Minnesota. They're all over the age of 67. So we're in a race to bring back our language. And we said, we're going to start it with our Wakayaja, our sacred beings. And that's how we're gonna bring it back. And recently we received dollars from ANA. Um, so super grateful for it. And we are really targeting the teachers and the parent ages so that when they're ready to have their bebenas, their wakaija, their children, they're raising them up in the language. So right now we are on level 8B, nearly extinct on the scale. And we're looking to get up to seven where the child rearing ages are speaking Dakota in their homes to them. And so we're all just trying to learn language and, and do it together in a good way. So our mission is to raise the next gen to raise the next generation of Dakota language speakers. So the whole reason of our existence is for our language and why we open doors. So really excited. Pidamia for having me. Uh, thank you as well. All right, and Marianne. Hi everyone, I'm Marianne Fanger from Anchorage, Alaska with Cook Inlet Tribal Council's Claire Swan Early Learning Center. We run a UPIC Immersion classroom um, ages six weeks to three years old. We chose UPIC Immersion, we do, our center is on Denina land, but we chose it because there were more fluent speakers um, in that language, but we do incorporate uh, Denina into our center as well. Uh, and so we serve um, six weeks to three years old and our our program actually extends even further outside of our center. Uh, we offer resources um, for our families and our community. We um, do the Yuktun uh, language aids. We have YouTube videos. We have books, um, That one that's coming out in the fall that is translated to social story um, that connects with the pyramid model. Um, it's an Alaska-themed social story, and it is going to be translated in Yuktun. Um, and we also offer, because we only go to three years old, we also offer a Saturday school for ages three through five, our alumni. And then we partner with our Anchorage School District College Gate Elementary School that has UPIC immersion in their classrooms um, from kindergarten to sixth grade. And so they created their UPIC immersion because they knew that we had the early start. Uh, UPIC immersion. So it's been a wonderful partnership. We also have um, elder mentors that come in. 
We have had a difficulty finding fluent speakers from time to time, so I, I hear you. <laughs> um, but we have developed a um, teacher apprenticeship program that has brought us a lot of UPIC uh, speakers. So we're really excited about that. We have an elder mentor program. We have a uh, trauma-informed care program, just wraparound support for, and we have a cultural enrichment curriculum that is centered around the seasons and the months in the YouTune subsistence calendar. So thank you. I'm glad to be here today. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists to um, share, describe briefly, thinking back to when you first began um, your work in this space and knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to those who are just beginning to think about how to integrate language and culture into programming? And Vanessa, I think I'm just going to go to you first because I I was there when you opened your doors yeah. and you had a big idea and big plans. Uh, but now you are, you know, six years beyond that. Uh, can you think back? Um, and I know that in language and culture were integ intimately integrated anyways, but there's a process, right? And there's a program to develop. And what advice would you give? Yeah, we, we were just babies. I was 23 years old. And all of us were like, yeah, we're going to be completely immersion in five years. We're going to be doing all of this and all of this good stuff. And now I'm like, okay, it, things take a lot longer um, than what you think. So it takes about 2000 hours for someone to get to intermediate mid. So that's conversational and be able to teach. Um, language. And so if that's a full-time job for one year, it's a part-time job for two years. So you really have to put in a lot of PD or professional development for your teachers because they can't teach what they don't know. And everything's going to be a lot slower, um, especially in our state of the language. It takes one generation to lose a, a language it takes three to bring it back. And so the systems that were upon us to have language loss were very effective, right? You know, tens and thousands of years ago, this land only knew Dakota. That That's all that this land knew. And now there's only five first language speakers left. You know, that is a pretty, th that was a great system. So it's gonna take a lot more resources for us to bring it back. And it's going to take a lot more time than we initially thought. So I think really making sure that you're putting that time, the effort, and the resources, um, and thus for the funders to do so as well, to help us grow and, and stand back together. So that's what I've learned so far. And that's a good point about the funders being patient. Huh. Uh, at their work, that their support, their funding needs to be patient and supportive along the way. And Tana, I know you've been part of this work for, I don't know, several decades, I think. Yep. What are your, what, what it lessons, learns, and advice do you have to share? I think I would actually sort of piggyback what, what Vanessa had just said in that it does take a lot of time. And I think that the, um, that sometimes hinders people to get started, you know, that they're not ready or that they don't have what they think they need to be successful. Um, and I think that any effort is good effort, you know, any, any well-intended, like people who just want to bring, you know, language to their children, like that's good work. Um, and so I think that, having like an idea of what the perfect school should look like or the perfect program should look like, like you, you kind of have to scrap that, you know, it, because it's, it, you know, it will, first of all, there isn't a perfect model, right? Like it's going to evolve and it's going to become what it, what you never imagined it might be in some ways and other ways it's going to be better and other ways it's going to take longer. And, and I think just, you know, getting, 
getting your feet wet is just really important and doing what you can do and working on what needs improvement, of course, but just doing what you can as soon as you have the money, as soon as you have the people, as soon as you have the support and let it grow. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think I'm going to ask this question to, to Marianne. I recently visited your uh, program and I saw the amazing materials that you've developed and the booklets and the art, and it's just really, really impressive. So could you share with us how you think Native communities, or at least your program, define and measure success in early childhood education? And then tell us a little bit about how this may differ from mainstream educational perspectives. Sure. Yeah. So defining my current success is just really watching the families and the children because ours are so little um, in age and we're just watching them form the language and learn to speak it. So we did have to develop and, and I agree with you all the patience and taking baby steps and knowing that you're going to have to build this program, build the curriculum, build the resources um, that that the teachers need to to utilize it in their education. Um, the other thing that we found um, is you, I can't just go anywhere and find a metric um, assessment on our children or our families developing this language in Yuktun. It's not out there, so we have to develop that. And we are still, I, you know, I just want to encourage people, it's okay, this is a living, breathing program, and there's gonna be times when you have to say, oh, we've gotta revisit this, we've gotta reiterate this. Um, this wasn't working. And so we're doing a lot of that still today. And we've had this program going on for um, five plus years. So it's it's an ever evolving process. We do feel like that our children and our families really connect when we create our resources that really speak to them. For instance, the reason we're doing an Alaska themed social story is because um, Timmy the turtle and that they use in the pyramid model is, we have no turtles in Alaska, so we're doing bear and his big feelings. Um, we're about to write one about the salmon always returning home. Um, so just really giving them that sense of pride in what we share together. Uh, we are unique that we're in an urban setting. And so we do serve at Cook Inlet Tribal Council, all the tribes in the state of Alaska. So it's, it, coming into an urban setting, it's a little different. And it also provides um, our, you know, our rural students and families that sense of connection. We do have a lot of cultural activities that we've integrated in that as well. And so I think that's how we're measuring success is the connectivity and their sense of pride um, in, in learning their culture, connecting with their culture and connecting with others. Wow, thank you, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. You know, when Katie Ham was uh, sharing with us some background about the ACF programs in early childhood, she recognized, uh, I think on behalf of all of us at ACF, that uh, the federal government and, and, you know, our programs as well were part of the destruction of native languages. And and taking that away, uh, and 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 with that destruction of languages, it taking away culture and identity, and obviously the result um, was was traumatic, was tragedy and trauma and violence and so forth. So I'd like to ask all of you, each of you, whether your your thoughts, I should say, on. Um, do Native early childhood programs address historical trauma? And Vanessa, I'll just start with you, please. Um, yeah, I'll just, yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, we believe that our language can help us heal from historical trauma. So with our language, it has our sense of identity, who we are, our worldview, our values, our, you know, geometry. I mean, it has every single piece of us within it. And so sometimes I hear folks saying, oh yeah, that's just nice. Just learning another language. No, I'm remembering, reclaiming and reconnecting to myself. And that helps me go forward. And there's so many different benefits that uh, commissioner mentioned earlier today. And so I just love language and 
Uh, an elder once told us, you know, Vanessa, you're born with Dakota Wichoha, the Dakota way of life. And that's who you are. And then something happens. You get thrown out on this other outside circle. And it's really fuzzy to get back to that Dakota Wichoha. And that's historical trauma. And so all those historical trauma events, I mean, we could talk for days about that and, and the, the hurt that's come out of it. And with it comes language loss. But he said, to get back to Dakota Wichoha, you learn your language and you learn yourself again. And with that, there's a whole healing portion of it. When do you absolutely get back to Dakota Wichoha? I don't know. I'm only 30, so I'm not quite sure. But my whole life's work is to keep going so that when my children are born, they will never not know what it's like not to speak their language. And that's what the healing is. And therefore, we're then growing ourselves and then we're growing our communities. Thus, we are strengthening our tribal sovereignty. So yes, absolutely, yes. Love it, love it. And I, and I think, and we'll, we'll go to you, uh, Natana, when you're doing this in a group, in a community, both with teachers, students, um, parents, you know, the whole family, you're, you have the ability to create sort of collective healing as well. Would you like to speak to that, Natana? Sure, yeah. I, uh, several years ago, um, one of our tribal members, who's actually now our chief recently, um, at least recently raised, um, he he had said um, in, an, in an interview at one time, uh, it's not our language that's lost, it's us. And so I think like I've really thought a lot about that over the 15 or so years since since I heard him say that. And, you know, the language isn't gone because the language is, you know, the trees still know what their names are, you know, here. Like they know, like our our language is so descriptive. Like it knows the things know what they are. They still do what, the, you know, they they perform their functions. We as people perform our functions. We interact with each other the way that we're supposed to. Um, so we know who we are and we have words to describe those things. So we haven't lost that, that, that meaning. It's just that we don't remember the words. And so if we, you know, learning and remembering those words like makes that, it makes that, final connection to you know action and and um being that we haven't necessarily lost track of we just didn't know that we didn't fully understand it if that makes sense um and i i think that you know coming back to language um for our community it is so healing because where there are things, there are wounds that we didn't necessarily even know that we had. Um, and we're really able to be our, our most like real and authentic selves as Wampanoag people. We actually, a few years ago, one of an exercise that we did with a parent group was to create Wampanoag words for colonization and decolonization. Um, and the word for colonization um, basically means like the the act of of causing someone to be put inside of a box, right? So like kind of literally and metaphorically. Um, and the word for decolonization, rather than kind of being the opposite of that, like it is in English, um, just means the act of intentionally living right again. Um, and so, and and the part of that that I think is the most important is the intention part, because we have this morpheme in our language that means like, you don't just think about it, you have to think about it and do it. And it's part of, like, it's in so many different words, like it's in the word for run, like, you don't, your body doesn't just run, you have to like, plan to run and then do it, right? Um, and so like decolonization is a process that you can't just like, snap your fingers and have happen, you have to like, be really intentional about it. And I think that our language has really helped us to do that across our whole tribe. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. And Marianne, we'll give you a few uh, minutes to share your thoughts on the healing aspects of, of language and culture before we break for the uh, breakout rooms. 
Sure, I, I, I feel strongly that we do heal from learning our language, but we also, I feel like our families and children at Claire Swan are healing because they see themselves in the learning. They see themselves um, in the books, the curriculum, um, that deep connection with one another, the deep connection to the land and its rhythms. Our classrooms are named around the seasons. Um, and so we feel like this approach really transforms our classrooms into those sanctuaries where there's indigenous wisdom and cultural heritage for our children and our families. Oh, that's beautiful. The sanctuary of our classrooms. Yeah. This is just such a wonderful panel session. Thank you all so much. I know our participants are eager to speak with you. So I'd like to uh, now move to um, uh, the breakout rooms. You'll be able to choose which room you'd like to join. Dr. Sims will be in room one. Dr. Green, Green Deer will be in room two. Vanessa Goodthunder, room three. And Marianne Fanger in room four. So this is an opportunity for so true. And uh, we had to stop mid response. 